All right, so now let's get down to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Verse 7. Notice what Paul says to us Christians. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now notice right here, Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. So remember, what does leaven represent? We studied last time it represented sin and false doctrine. Now in this case right here, it was sin. Because remember, there was a person in the church that committed incest and Paul had to kick out that person, turn that person over to Satan, and we already covered that last time. And Paul said, you have to get rid of any sin inside the church. So anything in your life or in this church that has sin, that has leaven, it must be purged out. You got to get rid of the leaven. Why? Because notice it says that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. The reason why you have to get rid of the lump of sin is because you're supposed to be an unleavened bread Christian. An unleavened bread, it won't be like leavened bread, having the lump, all right? Christians are symbolized, represented as unleavened bread. So if there's any leaven or lump, which is sin, it's got to be cast away. That's what that passage shows. Now the unleavened bread or unleavened lump, they call it, it represents the body of Christ. Didn't you know that? Remember what Jesus said, this is my body broken for you as he broke unleavened bread? Let's look at that chapter. Chapter 11, verse 23. Chapter 11, verse 23. Now, we're not going to turn to the other passage, but in 1 Corinthians 12, you will notice that we are the body of Christ, right? So we, all of us, the Christians, are the body of Christ. So because we are the body of Christ, and Jesus said, the unleavened bread is my body, then that means Christians are supposed to be an unleavened bread. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 24. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Notice what Jesus said about that unleavened bread. Verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. All right, now let's go back to our main text. All right, let's go back to our main text. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. So notice in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-24, the unleavened bread is the body of Jesus Christ. Now, who is the body of Jesus Christ? We Christians are. Thus, we should be unleavened bread. So if there's any leaven in the church, you've got to cast it away. All right? You've got to cast out the sin. Notice that verse 7 also says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. See? So that verse defines you what the unleavened bread represented. The unleavened bread is Christ's body being sacrificed, see? All right, notice this is Christ our Passover, see? And in the Passover, they ate unleavened bread. All right, now let's look at verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Oh, by the way, I forgot. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Now, here's an important passage. I guarantee you, every church, all right, every church excluding ours, if there is one that doesn't, then please let me know. But every church, they're going to say Matthew 13, 33 is a good thing. But no, it's a bad thing, all right? This is important. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, you know why people think that it's a good passage? Because it says the kingdom of heaven is like what? Leaven. See? Now, obviously, uh, we are the kingdom of God, all right? The kingdom of God is within the Christian church, all right? Now, when Jesus is quoting this parable, he says that the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. See? Now, throughout the Bible, what is leaven? It's negative, right? It's sin and false doctrine. Now, if those pastors really studied their Bible, they would have realized, well, this isn't a positive thing then. It's a bad thing, actually. Why? 
Because it says the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was what? Leaven. You know what that represents? It's a good representation of God's kingdom being corrupted, see? With sin, with false doctrine, and it grows more and more. See? So if you study the Bible like you should, if you realize that leaven was bad, you would have realized that in Matthew 13, 33, it would be talking about God's kingdom being corrupted with sin, being corrupted with false doctrine. Now, isn't that true? Oh, yes, it's very true. I mean, if you look back throughout history and even today in the New Testament age, we are being corrupted with false doctrine and leaven. God's kingdom is being corrupted a lot. That's the reason why we will not get a pure kingdom until the king of kings himself comes down right. at the millennium. Until then, notice that God's kingdom is corrupted with false doctrine and with sin. Now, no one is going to know this except you. All right, That's how sad, how scarce Bible truth is. All right, That's how scarce Bible truth is, sadly. Me. All right. Now, who is that woman then? People are automatically going to think that woman is the church. No. That woman who puts in the leaven in God's kingdom is a bad woman. Look at Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5. Didn't you know in the Bible there is a woman that puts corruption within God's people? Look at Zechariah chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. You know, the majority, if, if not all, if not all, the commentators... They're going to say that the woman is the church. God's kingdom with the leaven is being is representing God's kingdom growing bigger and bigger and we're going to have a happy world. It's no wonder it opens up for the tribulation, the Antichrist, the one world religion. Because they think that they can bring God's kingdom on earth. That they will spread out God's kingdom, see? But no, that verse is saying the opposite. That God's kingdom is going to be contaminated, which will open up the door for the Antichrist, the one world religion. All right, now let's look at Zechariah, chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Notice who the woman is. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, what? This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Let's also look at Zechariah, I mean, not Zechariah, Revelation, chapter 17. Revelation, chapter 17 Verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Notice that God calls her the great whore. That's what God calls her. God calls her Babylon the great. And notice, and it is very true, this woman has corrupted God's kingdom a lot. Revelation chapter 17, and verses 1 through 6. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, talked with me, saying, unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Notice this woman is corrupting all throughout the world, see? Corrupting the people. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I'm not going to read the whole passage. If you look at verse 5, though, God titles her mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Verse 6, she killed so many martyrs. Verse 7, the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. This woman will perfectly fit with Matthew 13, 33. All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians 5, 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Back in our main text. Back in our main text. So remember, Matthew 13, 33, that parable is not a good parable. Every pastor, if, if not all, every pastor is going to say, well, that represents... You know, the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, and the woman, which is the church, putting it in the oven and growing it into a big leaven, which represents God's kingdom is going to grow so big, so big, it's going to spread out throughout the world. No! That's the Antichrist kingdom! Amen. That's the Antichrist kingdom, you know that? Right. That passage showed you that the woman is that woman in the tribulation, and she's corrupting 
God's kingdom. That's what that verse said. The leaven represented sin. All right. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, notice right here that this passage shows you several things about this passage. All right? Notice right here it says... Therefore, let us keep the feast, right? You see that in verse 8, the first part? Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, what feast is Paul talking about? What kind of feast? Well, we can guess easily. That has to be the Lord's Supper. Because notice in verse 7, it says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. See, right there? And uh, if you also compare that with 1 Corinthians 11, 20, uh, we won't turn there because we already read it, but I wrote it down for some of you who want to write it out. If you write down this passage right here, 1 Corinthians 11, 20, 24 to 27, that verse mentioned Jesus Christ is our Passover, and that same context is the Lord's Supper. Jesus broke the unleavened bread. This is my body broken for you. And Paul, he called it a feast. He called it a feast. That's what he called it. You know what? Let's just turn over there. Some of you are... Looking into that, let's just turn over there. Let's look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. So when Paul says feast, he's referring to the Lord's Supper. That's what he's talking about, the Lord's Supper, eating the unleavened bread. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. 20. Let's pray here. When ye come together, therefore into one place, this is not to eat what? The Lord's Supper. Now, so this is talking about the Lord's Supper. Look at verse 24. Verse 24. That passage says... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do at ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So notice right here that this is undoubtedly talking about the Lord's Supper. And notice right here, it talks about Jesus Christ breaking the unleavened bread, etc. All right, now let's go back to our main text, 1 Corinthians 5. So when Paul talks about the feast and unleavened bread, Christ being the sacrifice, there's no doubt about it. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. That's the only thing he's referring to. All right. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. That verse defines you what leaven was then. That verse showed you that leaven represented sin. Because notice it says leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So notice that this verse already defined you what unleavened bread was. Unleavened bread represented what? It represented holiness, the right things. The thing is this. If you read the verse as it says, God will automatically show you if it is symbolic or metaphorical. See? God will show it to you. God will show it to you. You don't have to metaphoricalize every passage. That's why when you read Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, everyone, especially evolutionists, they make it metaphorical. God didn't really make it, the heaven and the earth. All right, It's metaphorically saying that God used evolution to make it. See? That's the danger of metaphorical symbolic interpretation. A Christian will take the verse as it says. If God says it, he means as he says it. Literally. This passage showed you if he was... Notice right here in this passage, he showed you if it was metaphorical, symbolic. He said, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven of malice and wickedness. See, it showed you if it was metaphorical in the passage. So just read it as it says, and it will show you if it's metaphorical or not. See, that's an important rule of interpretation as Christians. Because... When you come across a lot of these other religious cults and people, they interpret the verse too. But you can't tell if it's the right interpretation. That's why atheists, they'll say, well, how do you know it really means that? You know, you don't know. There are so many different interpretations in the Bible. No. The interpretation is you just take it as it says. See, that's it. God will show you if it's metaphorical. All right. Notice right here that this verse says we must keep the Lord's Supper without leaven, all right, which means without sin but rather in sincerity and in truth. Why? Because this is important. If you take the Lord's Supper, notice, therefore let us keep the feast, taking the Lord's Supper, not with old leaven, okay, not with sin, all right, but with what? Unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, with the right things. When you take the Lord's Supper, you should have no sin. You have to have the right thing. Why? 
Because when you eat the bread and drink the grape juice at the Lord's Supper without getting your sin taken care of, you can get punished. Look at chapter 11, verse 27. Chapter 11, verse 27. Some churches, they don't fix their sin problem before they eat the Lord's bread and drink the grape juice, which is, pro which is a problem. You got it. If you don't fix your sin problem, you're going to get punished. Look at chapter 11, verse 27. Chapter 11, verse 27. Notice right here, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. Notice right here, when you eat the Lord's Supper, you have to take it worthily, not unworthily. Now look at verse 30. Verse 30. For this cause many are what? Weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, if you look up that word sleep in John chapter 11 and Acts, that means you die. <laughs> that means you die. Is that possible? Yeah, it is possible. If you don't get your sin problem taken care of and you eat that bread without getting your sin problem taken care of, you could drop dead or either get sick or weakly. That's why an important rule is this. Before we take the Lord's Supper, you notice I'll say, let's confess our sins to God first. See, and when you confess your sins to God first and plead the blood, see, then you're taken care of, and then you can start to take the Lord's Supper. That's why it's a very important rule that before you take the Lord's Supper, you should confess your sins to God first and have God take care of that and get rid of that sin problem for you. Then you can start eating the bread and drinking the grape juice. Some churches that don't do that, <laughs> oh man, you're in trouble. You, you better start working on it. Especially you do it every week. Yeah, especially every week. All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. See, brethren, the, do you see more and more the treasure, the importance of being a Bible-believing Christian? Mm -hmm. If you don't, then imagine, imagine all those poor people out there messed up in all kinds of things, see? That's why it's so important to become a Bible-believing Christian. Amen. That's so important. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. All right, chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle... Not to company with fornicators. All right, notice right here that Christians are to practice separation from sinners like fornicators. This is very important. Problem with Christians is that they got their old worldly buddies, see, especially those that give a bad influence on them, hang around with that bunch, and they don't practice separation, and those bad worldly people become a bad influence on them, and then they come out messed up just like their old worldly friends, see. A Christian has to practice separation. It is very important, all right? No, you don't get friendly and get along with the world. You're supposed to be separated from the sinful world. Otherwise, they're going to put a sinful influence on you, and you're going to become like them, see? Amen. Now, notice right here, Paul says, I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators. Well, that means that Paul wrote in some kind of epistle where he commanded them not to company with fornicators. Well, what epistle was that? Well, to be honest, all right, if you're going to be really honest, that epistle is nowhere. It's nowhere in our King James Bible. What you got to remember is this. This is an important rule, all right? The important rule is this. God's inspiration does not only apply to what he puts in the Bible, which book he puts in the Bible. God's inspiration also applies to what he puts out of the Bible. That's a very important rule, all right? I'm not going to show you all the verses, but didn't you know there are a lot more books in your Bible that God has, that people have written out? Solomon, the Bible says, wrote out a thousand or a couple, hun hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs and Psalms. So see, not all of them are in our Bible. The Bible says that Paul, he wrote an epistle to the layout of Sand Church. Well, that epistle is not in our Bible. So what you must understand is this. When God inspires something in your Bible, it's not only to which book he puts in your Bible. Inspiration also applies to what he puts out of the Bible, yeah. see? So if God wants to leave something out of your Bible, you better leave it out. Yeah. And if God leaves something in your Bible, you better keep it in, all right? That's an important rule to remember. All right. Now let's look at chapter 5, verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must he needs go out of this world. So this is an important lesson, all right? If some of you have questions, you can study it online or even ask me ask afterwards on fellowship and separation. 
Notice that Paul says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. In other words, you don't separate them from them completely. Uh, why? You said earlier in verse 9 not to company with them. Well, yeah, but in verse 10, it's not completely separate. Why? Because Paul explains, uh, for then must ye needs go out of this world. In other words, you got to be out of the world. In other words, you either go to heaven or you're just dead. Because here's the thing, you cannot completely separate from everyone in this world, can you? No, they're around you in your workplace, in your family, in your life. I wish we could, you know, but we can't. You know why? Because we're in the world, see? We're living in the world. We're not of the world, but we're living in the world, see? Until you get out of the world, then you can completely separate from them. I wish we could, but we can't, see? We can't. Because we're living in the world. Sin is around you 24-7. Isn't that awful, Christians? It is awful, both you and I. We don't like it, man. But we live and breathe in it. That's the world we live in. So here's the thing, all right? What you got to realize is this. Then what's the borderline on whom should I separate, whom I should keep company with, right? Because, like, for example... Let's say you get a family outing together, a family get together, a family reunion. Not all of them are saved. Some of them are still having sinful problems. Does that mean you have to be separate from them? What about your workplace? Not all of them are by believers are saved, yet you have to be around them and work with them. So what's the borderline then? Here's an important lesson, all right? The borderline, the key is this. You only be with them on two reasons, all right? Two reasons. All right, first thing is when it glorifies God. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27. Paul, in the same book, all right, in the same book, he said not to company with sinners, but in the same book, he says, if a sinner invites you out to eat, eat with them. <laughs> That's what he says. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27. Chapter 10, verse 27. If any of them that believe not bid you a feast, bid you to a feast, what should you do? And ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. See? Paul said right here, just go out and eat with them. Why? Here's the key. Look at verse 31. This is a key. Wherefore, therefore, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. If a friend invites you out to eat at Denny's, okay, go out to eat as long as it glorifies God. See, Lord, I'm eating here done for your glory. That's what that verse says. Whatever you eat or whatever you do, glorify God. All right? If a friend says, let's go out on a drinking binge, you go out and you say, Lord, I'm doing this to glorify you. Now, obviously, you're not. See? See, you can tell when to separate, when not to separate. When to hang out with them, when not to hang out with them. If it glorifies God. That's the key. Now, why did God say to separate from them? The reason why he told you to separate from them is because they will negatively influence you. See, that's the reason why. If they negatively influence you, then you're supposed to be separate from them. But if it glorifies God, then okay. Look at chapter 5. Look back in the main text. Notice the context, okay? Look at the context. Look at chapter 5, verse 6. Back in our main text, chapter 5, verse 6 through 7. Remember, Paul said not to keep company with fornicators, right? And he was referring to that man who committed incest in the church. Why did Paul say separate yourself from that man, from that fornicator? Because of verse 6 through 7. Notice it had to do with influencing the church, see? Your glory is not good, knowing not that a little leaven, see, that little sinner, that little sin, it will influence the whole church. Leaveneth the whole lump. See that? Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven. So get rid of that. That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. You see that? Because I have to do with negative influence. Because that one little leaven, that one little sin that the sinner influences upon you, you have to get rid of it. You have to get rid of it. You have to wipe it out. So if they're influencing you, you've got to wipe it out. Look at chapter, look at verse 11. That's why, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a fornicator. See, that's the reason why he said that. Because it had to do with verse 6 and verse 7 by context. Context is because it was corrupting the church, see. 
It was negatively influencing the church. Likewise, if there's a person in your life that is corrupting your life, corrupting your spiritual walk with God or the church, you're supposed to separate from them. If they're not, then fine, okay? If they don't corrupt your life, fine, okay? But if they do, you better separate from them. Otherwise, you're going to be corrupted. Look at chapter 15, verse 33. Chapter 15, verse 33. So the borderline of separation and keeping company has to do with glorifying God and if it negatively corrupts your life, if it corrupts your life. That's the important borderline. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. See, notice right here. You communicate with the wrong crowd, it'll corrupt your own manner too. See, so the best thing is See, that's why you got to separate from those kind of people who has a negative influence or corrupts you with sin. Now, remember this. The borderline of separation and keeping company has to do with ne negatively corrupting you with sin and also with if it glorifies God or not. If it glorifies God or not. I know of uh, Christians who, uh, worked in, uh, who worked in businesses and these people really had like sinful problems and you know cussing out and they see sin in the workplace too. Oh, yeah. So some Christians what they did was that because it was influencing their life, some of them will have to quit the work and then uh, go to a different business which God blessed. But then there are other Christians who go to this workplace and then they have to hear their working workmates cuss out a storm and all that. But then, you know what they do? They put up with it, and uh, they try not to let that influence their life, and God still blesses them, see? So the thing is this. It's up to you. You know your life better, see, than I do. I can't judge and say, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. I can give you suggestions and advice, but that's all I can do. The final judgment decision is up to you. You're the one who draws a borderline if you should keep company or not, see? That's the thing. So remember, if it glorifies God, and obviously... Keeping your job so you can use the mind to support your life to serve God, that glorifies God. So keep it then, all right? So remember, you make the borderline yourself. Mm. All right, let's look at chapter 5, verse 11. Back in our main text, chapter 5, verse 11. All right. Notice right here. And now I have written unto you not to keep company. All right, so who, whom is a Christian supposed to separate from? Notice if any man that is called a brother. Ooh, so he's a same Christian. Really, Pastor? Yeah. You're supposed to separate from a safe Christian who is what? Be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such a one, no, not to eat. One of the rules of Christian separation is to separate from wicked Christians. Wicked Christians. That's what that verse says. Now, you are two other people you're supposed to separate from. You are the three rules of Christian separation. Three rules of Christian separation are number one, wicked Christians. All right, you saw that in this passage. Wicked Christians. Really? But they're saved, and yeah, you're supposed to separate from saved Christians who live wickedly. That's what that verse says. Hey, if that brother keeps committing, let's say that brother committed murder. Okay, you're gonna keep company with that brother? No, obviously not. Even if he's saved, you're not. All right. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Second group of people you're supposed to separate from, you can guess, are lost people. Lost people. The unsaved world. That's easy. 2 Corinthians, <laughs> that's right, brother. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. You know what one brother said? One brother said this, oh, you don't have to separate from your lost buddies. They'll separate from you. <laughs> you know, it automatically happens, brethren. Look, if they see you pray, you love Jesus, and you always argue with them on, you know, when they do something wrong, and you tell them, look, I can't listen to that, that's wrong. The, it will, the gap will grow greater, and you will separate from them. I guarantee you that much. Now, if not, then that means you're living wrong then, see? You yeah. must be living something wrong that makes them feel comfortable around you. Mm. <laughs> All right, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Notice right here, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. But be not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion, communion hath light with darkness? See, you're not supposed to keep crowd with the lost people, unbelievers. All right, the third group of people 
you could probably guess. People of false doctrine. People of false doctrine. Yes. This is why I cannot get... Hang out with them, right? Now, uh, okay, I know these people love Jesus, all right? They love Jesus, but you know what? Those churches, they teach wrong doctrine. Yep. That's why I cannot get along with them, yep. all right? Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Look, I want... <laughs> Trust me, all right? I know we all want to get along with everyone and live a happy life in a happy world. But you know why we have to separate from them? The key word is sin, see? Sin. When people give sin and also wrong doctrine, we can never get along, see? You can never get along. Nice person, they might even love Jesus. Hey, even Muslims love Jesus. You know that? Muslims love Jesus. They think he's a prophet. They think he's a prophet. But I can't get along with them. Why? Because they teach a false doctrine that damns people to hell. That's right. Amen. Non-denominational churches, charismatic churches, Episcopalian churches, community churches, Joel Osteen type of churches, Rick Warren type of church. I know they love Jesus too, but they give false doctrine. See, yep. they don't give. They don't teach the right dressing. They don't teach the right Bible, and they have the wrong music. See, that's why I have to practice separation. Romans sixteen seventeen. No, it's a command by God. Yes, it now is. I beseech you, brethren. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and what? Avoid them. See, you got to avoid those people who teach wrong doctrine. All right? Now, if they invite me as a guest speaker in their church, of course I'm going to go in and preach for them. You know why? Because I want to show them the truth. I want to show them how to get saved and get right with Amen. God. Of course I'm going to do that. Remember, there's a borderline, remember, a borderline of separation and keeping company. All right. The borderline is if it glorifies God. Now you betcha it's gonna glorify God if I preach in Joel's team church. I'm gonna, it's gonna glorify God. I'm gonna go there and give them what they need, man. It's gonna glorify God. So remember this: the borderline is if it glorifies God. If it doesn't glorify God, you better separate from them. Don't go out with your worldly friend, all right, in some drinking binge if it doesn't glorify God. All right. Let's look at. <clears throat> Back in our main text, verse 12. Back in our main text, chapter 5, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12. So you got a little bit about the basics of fellowship and, and separation. You got the main points of fellowship and separation. If you want to learn more, you can learn it online. All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12. Notice right here, now this will be a little difficult, so I'll try to explain it a little more. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? All right, so in other words, those that are without the church, not part of our crowd, all right? So those that are not part of the Christian crowd, those that are not within the Christian crowd. So you know who they are. They're the lost people, obviously. Do not ye judge them that are within, all right, within my crowd, all right, within my Christian crowd. So those are the saved people. So in other words, then, in this passage, what does Paul have to do with judging those outside of the Christian church, lost people, when they don't even judge those that are within the Christian church, saved people? <laughs> Notice that Paul says the Christian church should judge matters that are serious. They should judge matters that are serious within the church. Notice right here that there was a serious matter going on. Within their church, a fellow Christian committed incest. And then Paul says you're supposed to judge that matter. But these people, all they judge is stupid matters outside of the church. See? Petty ones outside of the church. How can you judge the lost people outside, brethren, when you can't even judge within, see? Within your own Christian church. See? That's the thing. How can you judge the lost people out there if you can't even judge yourself within the church? That's an important rule. So the, you know what the Corinthian church is? Again, I told you before, what is the Corinthian church? It's a perfect type of of a fleshy, carnal church of today. And you have to ask yourself, is your church like that, a carnal, fleshy church? You know what a carnal, fleshy church like the Corinthian church will do? They'll judge petty, stupid matters when they don't even judge about the more serious matters within their church. Mm -hmm. well, they judge petty things like, they judge petty things like, oh, you know, the brother said this to and so said this to me, and you know, oh, you know, this kind of thing. And they make a big deal out of, out of stupid ones rather than serious matters within their own life, within their own church. Amen. And that's the serious thing, Christians. In this case right here, it was fornication. There was fornication going on in the church. 
And they didn't even judge that man. All they did was point fingers and judge other stupid matters. All right. Now let's look at verse 13. Verse 13. All right, if you're not a carnal, fleshy church, then I better not hear a whine and complain about it. Like that. If you don't even take care, judge more serious matters. All right, let's look at verse 13. But them that are without God, judge it. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. Okay, now the first part, notice it says, but them that are without. Okay, again, who are those people? I told you before, those are the people, the lost people. Okay, those that are without the Christian church. Those that are outside of the Christian church. Those are the lost people. So what does God do with the lost people? Them that are without, the lost people, God judges. That's what that verse is. God's the one who judged them. Now, you don't have to worry about primarily focusing your judgment on lost people. You don't have to primarily focus your judgment on that because God takes care of them. God takes care of them. You know what? You've done your part. You warned them about hell. You showed them how to get saved. You know? What more can you do? You know? God will take care of the rest now. You know what? you got too many matters in your own life yeah. and in, among the Christian group that you don't have to waste time, waste all your hours, spending time judging the lost people. All right? Visitation, street preaching, okay, long enough, all right? But you got to think about your own spiritual life, too. you got to also think about helping other Christians, too. You know, true, one of the main points of a Christian is to evangelize the lost world. But that's not all there is to it. Let me repeat that again. That's not all there is to it. It's not just winning lost souls, all right? The second thing is edifying the saint. you got to take care of your own life and other people among your Christian church, see? And the third point, exalt the Savior. you got to glorify God, see? But people are just primarily focusing their judgment on lost people, all right? But, and they don't focus on the other important matters as well. Their own life, their own Christian church, judgment within the church. Okay, now, the last part, therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. So, notice right here, Paul says, okay, so kick out that wicked person, all right? We already know who that wicked person is. That's the person who committed incest in the church. Paul says, kick him out, get him out of the church. So, a Christian should practice uh, churching. That's what the Baptists call it. Or kicking out. We do kick out members. We do have to practice that. If there's a member in the church that commits a really wicked sin... That sets forth a bad example, especially this one right here, committing incest or fornication. We have to kick them out. That's what the Bible says. All right, let's look at chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Now, there's a mess going on right here, all right? The mess is that right here, Dare any of you, or do any of you fellow Christians dare, if you have something against each other? You go to law before who? The unjust, the lost people. And not before whom? The saints. And what the sad thing is, Christians, rather than dealing the matter amongst each other, they deal it in a court of law where it's completely nothing but lost people. That's a sad thing. Now, there are times though, we have to admit, there are times we can't help but bring it to a the law of court, right? I mean, like, you get in a car wreck and then insurance and all that kind of stuff, you have to go before the law, you know? There are times we cannot help but bring the matter into court. Why? Because of the laws of the land, okay? So here's an important rule, okay? If it's impossible to dispute it, to settle it in the church among you Christians, it is not a sin to bring it inside a lost person's court. It's not a sin. You know why? Because the Bible says we are supposed to submit to the laws of this land. That's what the Bible says. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. So remember this. If you can't settle it amongst by believers, amongst yourselves, and you can't help but bring it in front of the court because you have to according to law, then it's not a sin. Don't worry. You're supposed to. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Notice right here that we are, we are governed by the laws of this land and God says every soul, every soul, lost and saved soul, should be submissive to the laws of this land, all right? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, all right? The higher powers of this land, okay, the president and the kings, the prime ministers, okay, we're supposed to submit to them, all right? 
I do not appreciate President Barack Obama, especially with his liberalism. However, he is the president, and we are supposed to submit to him, and amen to that. We are supposed to. Now, of course, if it contradicts the Bible, if Obama says, you know, worship me or something like that, then you're supposed to go against that, okay? You have to govern, okay? It's more important to obey God rather than men. See, there's that balance. You got to realize this, Jesus also, when he was, he was brought before the court of unbelievers, you know that? And he went by the rules of the unbelievers' court. Look at Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. Notice Jesus Christ was brought before a lost man's courtroom, all right? Remember, he was brought before those unbelieving Jews. At a court, at a trial, Matthew chapter twenty-six, verse sixty-three. Matthew chapter twenty-six, verse sixty-three. Notice what Jesus said before an unbeliever's court. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, "I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God." In an unbeliever's court, you have to take an oath, you know, to hold you nothing but the truth to help you God. Do you feel uneasy about that? Sometimes I do, you know, in a lost man's court. But notice that this high priest made Jesus swear to an oath. You know what Jesus did? Verse 64. He answered. He went by that oath. He went by the laws of the land. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall he see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Notice that Jesus did respond to the oath. He says, Okay, I'll swear by the oath. Okay, Yes, I am the Son of God. And even though he went by the laws of the land, their laws, they still killed him. They said, you're a heretic, blasphemer. And he was just going by their laws. See, that's the thing a Christian ought to do. A Christian, even though you have to go by the laws of unbelievers, you got to give forth a good testimony. That's very important. Jesus saw that his testimony was very important, so he had to preserve it. All right. Now, let's look back at Romans chapter 6, verse 2. Romans chapter 6, verse 2. So remember, there's nothing wrong with going to court in an unbeliever if it can't be helped. However, you should settle the matter among you Christians, not amongst unbelievers, all right? You know what's really sad? There was there are there are pastors who fought with deacons and they go before an unbeliever, a judge who is not saved, a jury who are not saved. Lawyers who are not saved, and they go before an unbeliever court and hear all these lost damn souls seeing saved Christians fighting each other, suing each other. Now that's a horrendous testimony, see? That's the reason why Paul was accusing the Corinthians. You shouldn't bring it to court before the unbelievers. You've got to settle it amongst yourselves. So if Brother Daniel and Brother Sean sued each other just because they found personal disputes, that's a horrendous and a sad, terrible testimony. It should be settled among the believers, the Christians, amongst each other. All right, let's look at verse 2. Amen. Let's look at verse 2. Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world, and the world shall be judged by you? Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? This is a very important verse, because Paul says the saints will judge the world. He said that, all right? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? Yes, That's what that verse says. Boom. And he says, if you can judge the world... Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? See? So how come you can't even take care of the smallest matters? Yeah. If you're going to judge the world. Now, when the lost people criticize you about judging, this is what you tell them. You tell them you will judge them at the great white throne of judgment. Yep. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> you will. No, Pastor. Yeah, look at yeah, Revelation 20. I think we sold it. Look at Revelation oh, 20. Oh, it's me again. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Come on now, preacher, you teach it. Bury that meat. Revelation chapter 20. Now remember again, all right? I love the meat. In this passage, there is a balance with judging and not judging. We studied that, right? Yep. So then remember, you're not supposed to primarily focus your judgment on lost people when there are more weightier matters you've got to judge. However, that doesn't altogether completely eliminate judging the lost people because you're supposed to judge them. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Oh, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Notice right here, verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, 
and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 15, a lost soul was cast into the lake of fire. Notice that these lost people are judged at the great white throne of judgment of God. And guess who will be at that great white throne of judgment of God judging them? Hello. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Oh, Daniel no. chapter 7. Notice right here in Daniel chapter 7 verse 10, all right? That here the unbelievers are judged and notice that the saved people are in this great white throne of judgment. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. All right, remember Revelation 20? The books were open. Those lost people were judged. So there's no doubt about it. This one is talking about the great white throne of judgment where lost people are judged. Now, notice though it says, thousands, thousands ministered unto God, unto him. So notice right here that we're ministering, we're helping out God in this judgment. See? So there's no doubt about it. See, we will judge the lost world too. You know what then? What's going to be sad? That lost person who rejected a Christian witnessing to him, that same Christian will point his finger at him and judge him and says, no, remember that time? I witnessed to you. I showed you how to get saved and you rejected him. You know, see, hard. that will be difficult. Saved, that will be difficult. It's not easy to see to see you cast it, being one of the ones responsible Judge passing judgment and casting them to the lake of fire. That's not easy. That's not easy. See, that's why there will be tears. There will be Christians weeping right. too. That's right. Because they will see their lost loved ones damned to a burning hell. Co-workers. Yeah, co-workers as well. All right, so we will close it right here. We're going to close it right here. We'll continue our interesting next studies next week, Lord willing. Sounds good. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your precious and most holy book. I can see my members growing so much more spiritually through this teaching session. They're learning so much that they haven't learned in other churches. Oh God, how sad it is not only to see so many lost souls going to hell, but even save people who don't have the truth that we do. Your Lord God, I pray that somehow in some way you'll use this church mightily to spread out the truth and that other people can partake in the blessing of enjoying this truth as well so they can grow in grace and learn so much knowledge from the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.